joy, satisfaction, pain, hunger, sadness, violence, sensations, feelings are ultimately at the heart of human history. Avoiding them, encouraging them, pursuing them, studying the best way to provide for them, the moral economy of feelings pushes history away or towards ideas, warfare, innovation, political systems. Which ways will we organize to maximize positivity? Or conversely, what is it that's happened when a knife is plunged into a soldier or an African American is dragged to the town square by a raging mob? These moments are often driven by historical forces. A force, as we know from physics, is an impulse, a pressure, an energy that exerts itself upon an object or a person. In history, we talk of economic, social, cultural and political forces. We also might hear someone be described as a forceful character. Social forces are difficult to imagine, but an idea built upon the shoulders of history, translated into sound waves and gestures by a charismatic dictator or a quietly convincing scholar, hits your eyes and ears with all the power of a physical force the same power and might move you to speak, to transcribe, to protest, to work, to kill. In fact, the great movements in history, wars, campaigns, revolutions, genocide, progress, have for a long time now been described by most historians as being driven by forces rather than by individuals. The French Revolution's cultural causes, the force of the ideas of the Enlightenment, economic forces like depression or hyperinflation that contributed to the rise of the Third Reich, say, the institutional corruption of the Catholic Church leading to the Reformation, the economic forces that drove Africans helplessly over the Atlantic on slave ships, and the scientific beliefs that served to rationalize their subservience for centuries. historical forces move people to act in ways that seems to suggest they're devoid of their own force, their own free will, their own power to resist or choose for themselves. That if George Washington or Robespierre or Martin Luther King or Karl Marx had never been born, someone else, shaped by the same forces of the context they lived in, would have inevitably, at some point, taken their place. Maybe in slightly different ways, but with the same fundamental underlying principles. If Bill Gates or Steve Jobs were never born, someone else would have been at the center of the development of personal computers, for example. There were several reasons lynch mobs in Jim Crow America and soldiers and police officers in Nazi Germany were motivated to kill African Americans and Jews. Historical forces, like a sense of victimhood, both having lost recent wars, cultural forces and propaganda that depicted victims stereotypically as inferior, greedy or a threat, and economic forces, poverty, inequality, the frustration of basic needs, as social psychologist Irvin Stubb puts it. Reasons in both cases, as I've explored in previous videos, were similar the supposedly powerful Jewish interests that were colluding to deprive ordinary Germans, and the black Americans, through their natural inferiority, who were going to pollute the racial purity of the white race. In the lynch mobs that murdered black southerners, the participants were under no illusions that they might not have been doing the correct thing, the moral thing, the ethical thing. Difficult may be, but just all the same. They were motivated in Nazi Germany and Jim Crow America by a moral culture made up of stereotypes, adverts, literature, supposedly scientific studies, societal standards, norms and sensibilities that all pushed the perpetrators towards killing. And in both cases, the perpetrators had rationales, justifications, reasons for what they were doing, even if with historical hindsight, we can see 
that those reasons were incorrect. But there are points in memoirs and testimonies that fascinate me, points of resistance, where despite the historical forces bearing down upon them, the perpetrators have a moment of conscience, maybe, or something like it. When a German commander, tearful and shaking, tells his men that they have to kill women and children. When ordinary police officers in the Nazi order police report being sick, crying, being able to pull the trigger. When one soldier describes the scene as bestial, others reported, and this is consistent with evidence from other genocides too, that if they knew the person, or they'd gotten to know them even slightly while they were a prisoner, they'd have to leave the killing to someone else. This was reported in Rwanda. In her autobiography, Catherine de Prelumpkin, a white American southerner from a slave-owning family, describes her racial awakening. She was 19, listening to an African-American talk at a college conference on race. The speaker was introduced as Miss Arthur, a form of address reserved for whites in the South. She imagined having to shake Miss Arthur's hand, and she panicked. When she closed her eyes though, listening to Miss Arthur, she realised she couldn't tell her race from the way she was speaking. Later, she realised that the heavens had not fallen, nor the earth parted asunder to swallow up this unheard of transgression. Indeed, I found I could breathe freely again, eat heartily, even laugh again. Another autobiography, Anne Braden's, recalls eating a meal with an African American for the first time something that was forbidden, and forgetting about race, and realising why there is no race problem at all, there are only the people who have not realised it yet. These moments, as few and far between as they are, beg an important question. How is resistance possible? How does one know when they're being pushed by historical forces to do something that in retrospect we see as wholly immoral? How does one escape from under the hand of history? If culture, society and the economy are all moving you towards acting in a particular way, do we retain any kind of moral sense? The philosopher Zygmunt Bauman, for example, has asked whether there can be a moral responsibility for resisting socialisation. The point of looking at history in this way is to understand how we can recognise similar conditions in the present, whether we can examine our own principles, standards and norms, and ask whether we'd ever know what the right thing to do is. Often, what makes people like Rosa Parks or Martin Luther notable is not that they are shaped by history, but that history, the very same forces, are felt by them as coercion, and that they decide to stand up to them, to counter them, to resist them. Like a stick flowing down a river, actors are either taken along by the flow of history, or, like a fish, they can, for some reason, resist. The question that's been asked by many like the philosopher Hannah Arendt, is whether this could ever absolve the lyncher or the contributor to genocide of any guilt. Are they morally innocent if historical forces are at work upon them, as if they're coerced by another and aren't even aware of it? If the factors that lead to atrocities are larger, economic, cultural, social, even scientific, and the people who create the narratives are elites, not the ordinary people that carry them out, then is the ordinary man or woman ever to blame? Where do we find that causal point of moral action or moral blame? That bit where we can say that was ethically wrong or right, you should have known better. Can we find it so that we can discourage or encourage more of it? One way to approach this is to ask what we admire in figures like Rosa Parks or the rescuers of Jews during the Holocaust. The first thing, I think, that's obvious to note is that they were doing something difficult. They resisted those historical forces that were bearing down upon them, as if struggling out from underneath heavy metaphysical weights. Morality is only interesting when it's difficult. The moral acts that we celebrate are often those that are most difficult, that cost the person in some way. We can examine this on a banal level too. 
It's cold, rainy, you're tired from a long day, and it's your friend's birthday. You said you'd go out. This wouldn't be a loosely moral situation if it was a sunny Saturday full of energy and you wanted to go out anyway. What makes it morally interesting is that you do the right thing by going out despite finding it difficult to find the motivation to do so because you want to be a good friend. Morality consists in resistance, in difficulty. Now, we usually think of resistance as being a type of strength. The rubber band resists snapping under pressure when stretched. So where does this moral strength to resist historical forces come from? If we can find this, do we locate the source, the wellspring, the elixir of morality? As we've seen, the perpetrators thought they were doing the right thing. That there was an entire universe around them of cultural reasoning that went into protecting the colour line or cleansing the homeland. Many even rationalised killing Jewish women and children by telling themselves they wouldn't survive another harsh, war-torn, foodless winter anyway. That because of this, they were doing the humane thing, the correct thing, the moral thing. Strength here seems to be the difference between accepting the reasoning provided for you and challenging it. I think that can happen in two ways. One is knowing that the cultural facts presented to you are wrong, false. The Nazis, for example, used Theodore Kaufmann's book Germany Must Perish as propaganda to convince Germans of a Jewish plot against them. They claimed in propaganda that Kaufmann's book was influential in America on American foreign policy, despite it in reality being a fringe, unread book that most people wouldn't have heard of and was panned by critics. If you know this to be a mistruth, a lie, a piece of propaganda, you're less likely to be influenced by it to eventually, potentially murder. You can reason your way out of doing the immoral thing. But what if you accept the propaganda? What if you believe the falsehoods and the stereotypes? The other way to build moral strength comes not from reason, but from emotion, empathy. The Scottish philosopher David Hume had a lot to say about morality. For Hume, morality, rather than being grounded in reason or thinking logically, was at its core a feeling. Adam Smith called morality a sentiment. When we see someone in pain, for example, we can literally feel that pain in some way in ourselves. And conversely, when we see someone happy, we might feel raised in our spirits too. This is what we'd refer to as empathy today, a word which wasn't around when Hume and Smith were writing in the 18th century. Empathy is feeling joyful yourself, hearing someone say something moving, the feeling of disgust seeing someone mistreated, being moved to tears by a scene in a film. When these things happen, something beyond thinking, beyond cognition is going on, we're moved by others. Hume wrote that, Where friendship appears, my heart catches the same passion, and is warmed by those warm sentiments that display themselves before me. In this way, empathy is a kind of involuntary translation of one person's feelings into another's. Hume talks about passions, good or bad, being contagious, of another person's feelings almost being infused into yours. How is this the basis of morality? Well, we approve, we judge as moral, the things we imagine to cause pleasure or good feelings within us and others, and we disapprove or judge as immoral the things that cause pain or bad outcomes. If someone hurts someone, we might feel the pain the person is in and feel cold towards the perpetrator. We feel metaphorically, but in some sense literally, chilled towards them. Conversely, we might feel warmed by someone's warm-heartedness or tenderness. Morality as empathy can spread as a type of infusion, hence the hot and cold metaphors. Moral philosopher Michael Sloat has argued that empathy is the moral cement of the universe. 
thinking about morality and empathy in this way as something that often resists socialization might help us to understand that idea of resistance to those historical forces. The economics, the cultural and social beliefs, the attitudes, sensibilities, norms and codes that can bear down on us. That no matter how powerful they can be, empathy can interrupt them. But of course, looking at the Holocaust and lynchings, that obviously didn't happen. Most seemed content to be unempathetic towards their victims. Why might this be? I think we can look to three factors. Proximity, equality and education. First, proximity. We usually feel more empathy when the pleasure or pain we're seeing or hearing is spatially or temporally nearer to us. We feel more empathy for the child drowning in front of us than a starving child thousands of miles away, even though we know that the latter is more frequent. Jews and African Americans were segregated. As Bauman pointed out, the Nazis had an entire system of bureaucratization to keep distance between those doing the killing and the Jews, breaking tasks into separate components, admin, driving trains, loading gas, to make it easier for the killers because asking them to shoot thousands of men, women and children had been proving difficult for the leadership. Bauman says, the significance and danger of moral indifference becomes particularly acute in our modern, rationalised, industrial, technologically proficient society, because in such a society, human action can be effective at a distance. Second, and related, equality. Empathy requires imagining that you and the person you feel empathy for have the same faculties, the same capacities for pleasure and pain, the same hopes, fears and dreams. It requires an understanding that we all share a similar range of emotions and feelings, a fundamental equality. African Americans and Jews were dehumanised, described as separate races, and in many cases, almost separate species. Finally, but still related, is education, or at least the need to be reliably informed. This happens in many ways, of course. For the psychologist Martin Hoffman, empathy is developed through experience. Parents, for example, disciplining their child when they've hit another child and asking questions like, how do you think your friend feels when you hit him? Others have pointed to novels in the 18th century expanding the circle of empathy by describing the inner lives of people you would have never ordinarily encountered. An empathetic education then, of some kind, is important. But there is a final reason empathy or resistance might not be triggered, related to education. Perpetrators simply didn't know the truth. We might say that the perpetrators were being empathetic, just to their own in-group rather than the victims, friends and family who they believed were in danger in some way. And we might also say that the perpetrators were being reasonable. Perpetrators must have in some sense used their reason to conclude that despite the pain it might cause black Americans or Jews, they were inflicting that pain for some kind of greater good. They were using a moral principle. They thought it was, despite the difficulty they sometimes might have felt, the right, correct, moral thing to do. I think the problem here is quite simple. Their information was wrong. Resistance and empathy is only possible if you know the book Germany Must Perish, for example, is not informing US foreign policy, if you know that the propaganda is based on falsehoods, or if you know that a particular African American has been wrongly accused of a crime. And I think this is a difficult truth. In many cases, the perpetrators, the ordinary men and women, didn't know. They were being led. And so the condemnation, the blame, 
that causal point of responsibility is moved above them into the public sphere, into the leaders, authors, thinkers who lied, who made mistakes, who printed mistruths rather than the ordinary men and women. So what have we found? Have we discovered that spring, that elixir, that foundation of morality, of resistance? We can at least say that morality is found somewhere in the midst of difficulty. It's only found in resistance, but that it's grounded in empathy, which is learned through a moral education in some way. Also, a public sphere that keeps all people in its view, make sure no one is distanced, in other words, is inclusive, and an understanding that we all share the same faculties, that we are all emotionally and cognitively at the base, at the foundation, the same. And of course, a commitment to due process, to principles, to codes and norms and standards in all institutions, to making sure we're all searching for the truth. Because knowing what the right thing to do is, is often akin to knowing what the right facts are. Thank you as always for watching and a huge thanks of course, as always, to my Patreons, without which this just wouldn't be possible. So if you want to see scripts, if you want to chat in the Discord server, if you want your name in the credits, but most of all, if you just want to help support make this content, then click the link in the description below. If not, you can like, you can share, you can leave a comment, all those things that help the algorithm. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time.